lift up praise. Shout to the north and the south.
spirit in it in my bones. You're going to send revival, bring them all back home. Oh, and I can hear that thunder in the distance, like a train on the edge of the
as you come alone and sit there as you come again to make it right through a heavenly mound of stones you're lifted you become a lowly sacrifice and here we are the walking wounded
become a living sacrifice. We become living sacrifice. Would you pray? We need to revive us. We need you to revive us every day, Lord. We need to come to you. As we lift a praise tonight, Lord, that's what we're doing. We're giving you all the praise. We're giving you all the glory here tonight. We're laying it all down. Jesus
Tonight we're going to have communion. And I'd like to invite the servers if they would uh, come down to their stations at this time. A good number of you already know. Jesus, we pray that that would not be just words, but in, uh, first of all, about Church 101, uh, I can't overemphasize the importance of Church 101, and uh, Cheryl and I have been teaching this for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, I guess it is, and it's a wonderful time for us to connect with many of you that we don't know, and uh, it's three and a half hours. And, but we do have a continental breakfast within that. But it really does give you an opportunity to understand where we're headed, what our vision is, what our goals are. And uh, I think Cheryl and I love teaching that class about more than anything that we do in the church. And so if you're thinking about it, we'd love to have you come uh, next Saturday. Second of all, we have some missionaries with us tonight that I need to introduce. And uh, one of them spoke to us, but his wife wasn't here last week or the week that he spoke. She was here last week, but we didn't see her until it was too late. And it doesn't really matter. But anyway, Lynn and Marty Green, would you stand up? And uh, bless you. And Sharon, Sharon Joy, stand up too. Good to have you. And uh, by the way, those of you that ordered the little book that Lynn uh, talked about, it's in. So if you will look at it there in the uh, information booth or go by 
pay your five bucks and get it, okay? And then the second one is uh, Donna Dion Stevens from Mercy Ships and been our friends and uh, with us for quite some time as missionaries here, but Donna and Dion and Charles Wesley, God bless you. It's good to have you guys. So, continuing on our series, Values That Stand the Test of Time, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Samuel 24. And tonight we want to talk about developing self-control. Anybody here came to the right service? <laughs> developing the self-control, what a huge undertaking that is, huh? Any area of our lives left out of control has the ability to devastate or even destroy our lives. If we allow anger or bitterness, finances, our thought life, revenge. Anybody here got revenge issues? To get out of control, it absolutely has the ability to destroy our lives. We're going to talk about David and Saul. We're going to talk about the conflict that was going on between them. And it is my opinion that you can take a lot of different applications from the scriptures. But there's really only one true meaning of it. And I think that what is coming across in 1 Samuel 24, now this is my opinion of it, is David exhibiting self-control. And for us to understand this whole situation, we have to understand what the story is about. The story is about King David. Well, he wasn't actually king at this particular time, but another king by the name of Saul. And Saul was basically found himself after the Lord had anointed him to be king out of control. And he found in different ways not to follow the Lord fully. He actually was kind of an independent guy. And basically said, I'll do it my own way. Kind of like what our national anthem is here in America, I'll do it my way. And he took off and he began to do things so much to the place that God got displeased with him and told Samuel, who was a prophet of God, I've rejected Saul as being king. But I have found another guy who is after my heart, and his name is David. And I want you to anoint him as king. Well, the story gets out. Saul finds out that this guy that actually David, he knows about, is now going to be his predecessor, and he feels very threatened by that. So what he wants to do is he wants to take care of that issue by killing King David. Now here's the, here's the real point in the understanding of, that I get from David is this, and I think it would probably minister to most of us here tonight, is that when David is in close relationship with the Lord, he's under self-control. As a matter of fact, there are two times. This time in, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, God actually delivers Saul into David's hand, and we'll read about that. Then again, in, in chapter 26, he does exactly the same thing. But David holds restraint. In a split second of time, he makes up his mind, I will not kill God's anointed. Now, why does he do that? Well, that's one of the, some of the issues that we want to explore tonight. Why did he show himself to, to have such self-control at those particular times when it would have been really easy just to, to kill King David or King Saul? And let me just say this about Saul, too. All of us have Sauls in our lives. It is not our responsibility to take care of them. God will. The idea and the understanding that we have is that when David is in close relationship with the Lord, he has this self-control that is going on in his life. He understands that what is exhibiting right now is because I'm having relationship with the Lord. But every one of us go through times in our life where we really wonder, at a particular time, am I going to exhibit self-control? Now, I don't make these situations up, but I want you to know this week I was severely tested in the area of self-control. And I went to the bank, and Thursday is our payday, and I went to the bank, and I put in my deposit slip, and what I wanted back was $20, where you write down less cash received. And so the gal took it, and when it came back and was delivered to me, as soon as I took a hold of the envelope that she put it in, I knew that this was a lot heavier than just a $20 bill. <laughs> and the first thing, and you would be sitting there thinking, well, I'm sure that Pastor Dan did the right thing. Well, I want to hold you in suspense for just a moment. 
Because when I felt that, I thought, oh man, this is going to be a test. I hadn't even looked at it, but guess where my eyes went? My eyes went to the receipt. And the reason that it went to the receipt is because I wanted to see if she had deducted the $200. She hadn't. It was 20 so, she, so it, was the, it was the proper amount that was coming back. So in other words, in my mind, in my quick calculation, I had just made $180. <laughs> this is the day, you know. You see. <laughs> now, I knew immediately at that particular time what I was supposed to do. But I want to be very honest with you. It took just a moment for my little hand to go out that door and push that call button. You know why? Because every one of us deal with self-control. As a matter of fact, when we go on in David's life, and we're going to see tonight that he really shows this ability to restrain himself, to have self-control, there are a couple other times that he doesn't. One of them is with Bathsheba. And he looks out the window one night and he sees this beautiful woman bathing. And he asks this man, as a matter of fact, the man that's going to go fetch, who is she? And he comes back and says, King David, that is Bathsheba, listen to this now, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. In other words, even in godly counsel, what David is receiving is, don't touch it. That's holy ground. Stay away from it. And David, even though he has self-control in one area, we find out that at this particular time, he doesn't. And he crosses the line. Why? Why does that happen? Let's go on to another incidence of what happened to King David. It even says in the scriptures at one point in 1 Chronicles 21, that the enemy, Satan, came up and stirred this thing up in David's heart, and that was to take a census of all of Israel. And even Joab, who is his closest friend, says, David, you shouldn't be doing this. Because basically what you're doing is you're taking your dependency away from God and you're putting it upon all the numbers of the warriors that you have, and that's not wise. And David goes ahead and does that and suffers incredible consequences from the hand of God. Why do we see David in so many circumstances where he has self-control and yet at other times he doesn't have self-control? What, what's, what's missing? And I'd like to kind of share this with you, what, at least what my understanding of it is. Is that when we're in, and I think the key word, loved ones, and hear this clearly tonight. I think the, the key word for self-control is called intimacy. When we're in relationship with the Lord, and there really isn't anything that is between us, there's a tremendous amount of self-control around. But all of us know that there are times when we are tempted away and when there are times when we're not near as close as we should be and then we find sometimes that our self-control isn't where it should be. And David comes around and at least in this, this particular example shows us how to demonstrate self-control. Now why does the Bible go on and talk about a couple of areas where David didn't have self-control? Now I think you can take this one to the bank. I think the reason why the Bible shows this one, is simply because none of us are ever going to be the place on this side of heaven where we don't have to deal with self-control. All of us, it's an issue. All of us get to a place, and it doesn't matter what, the, what it is, all of us get to a place where we think that we can live our life without God. And God says, you can't. And the only way that you can keep your life under control is to have intimacy with me. So if you'll turn to first chapter or first Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, we want to talk about self-control tonight. Verse 1. And after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he told, he was told, David is in the desert of in Jedi, or in Gedi. And so Saul took three thousand chosen men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the Craigs of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. And David and his men were far back in the cave. And the men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said, To you I will give your enemy into your hands, for you, 
for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David was conscious stricken, stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord anointed, the Lord's anointed. Or lift up my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. And Saul looked behind him. David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift up my hand against the master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the Lord, as, I mean, as the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Against whom is the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. And when David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. If you have your little outlines this evening, you want to follow along and take them out, let's take a look at five truths about self-control. Five truths about self-control. Number one is this. Quick and easy solutions are often counterproductive to self-control. Quick and easy solutions are often counterproductive to self-control. Verse 4. And the men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand for you to deal with as you wish. These men were saying something that God hadn't said. In other words, they saw a quick, easy solution. Hey, David, all you have to do now is kill this guy, and we've got the solution to our problems. I want to stop and talk about that for a minute, because there are so many times when you and I get ourselves in difficulties, and the reason why we get ourselves in difficulties is simply because we take the easiest solution that's available, only to recognize that later it causes us a lot of heartache. David, I don't even think, is aware as to what's going on. But being a person of self-control and recognizing that that is not what he's supposed to do, he withholds himself. Now, here's, here's a key thing. That when we develop self-control, usually what's happening is that we are learning the character of God. Have you ever noticed that God is never early? I mean, he's never late. Boy, and he's missed some golden opportunities to be early, but he doesn't do it that way, and he works on time. And it seems to be, and, and really what most of us deal with is this hurried pace that we find ourselves in. And David says, that is not going to be the solution to this situation. I don't even think he is cognizant of the fact of what God is actually doing. Because if David would have killed Saul, what he would have been doing is he would have been teaching his men, this is how and the way that you deal with a king when you're in sharp disagreement, you kill him. And let me tell you something, some things are going to come up between David and his men that would offer that kind of an opportunity. So really what's going on here is God is saying, don't take the easy way out. First of all, I never said that I would give King Saul into your hand. He said, I will tear the kingdom away from him and give it to you. But he never ever did say to Saul, I mean to David or to his men, that you can kill him. And that's what happens to us, is that we take the easiest ways out. And here's what David is doing. He's teaching, hear this clearly, he's teaching through modeling to be loyal. Now here's something really clear. 
Loyalty is an attribute of the kingdom of God. Disloyalty is a kingdom or an attribute of the kingdom of darkness. So when we look at this and we understand that David is really learning a lesson himself, he's actually passing it on, is that when I'm learning to be loyal, even though when I have the opportunity to take care of a problem that I think of that will really satisfy the situation for the moment, lots of times it develops greater problems down the road. Self-control. Let me give you an example. Lots of times what happens to people when they get in lots of pain, and just, just deal with this. Being a pastor now for 22 or 23 years, I found this to be very true, is that every one of us, when we get in pain, we will find something to anesthetize that pain. And when we find the wrong thing, it may be the answer for the moment. And by the way, the scriptures tell us about that. You know, there is pleasure in sin for a season. And it feels good. And sometimes people will turn towards alcohol or drugs, and it takes away the problem only for a moment, and then they have greater problems. See? And God is saying that is not the way you deal with it. Self-control. You don't deal with the easiest solutions that might be there. You deal with it God's ways. Amen? Number two. Inward struggles often reveal that self-control is at work. Inward struggles often reveal that self-control is at work. Verse 5. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. David's conscience was working because it bothered him. That's a good thing. When our conscience isn't bothering us any longer, means we are losing the battle for self-control. Now, no one understands something here, friends. No one understands the nature of sin. When our conscience is at work, and here's, here's a, uh, something for all of us just to really kind of think about, is our conscience has been given to us to uncover things that we would rather cover up. The nature of sin is this, is that it grows and it proliferates under darkness. Again, and I used this illustration a couple of weeks ago, but I'd like to share it with you again. I don't know how many times someone has come into my office and we have closed the door and they have said these words. Pastor Dan, I have never said this to another living soul. And I want you to know the atmosphere in that room gets very intense. And then they begin to share what it is that they have never shared with anybody else. And you know what happens to the atmosphere in that room? It changes. You know why? As a matter of fact, I've, I have talked to people after they, you know, have shared and just saying, how difficult was it for you to come? It's like, it's like the biggest thing in my life to cross that road. You know what was working in their mind, in their heart, in their spirit, their conscience? Something was bothering them. And the idea, because of our brokenness, is to cover that up. And yet, the opposite is just the true in the kingdom of God, is that we need to expose it. Because when we expose it, see, that self-control, when we, when we expose that thing, and we do it God's way, then what happens is there's a tremendous amount of relief. Even when we go back to David. David's conscience bothered him when he sent for Bathsheba. The problem was, is that he kept it hidden. And under hiddenness, what happens to us is that sin proliferates and then the nature of sin grows. And not only did he sin with the idea of adultery, but then he lied and then ended up in murder. I remember watching Ted Bundy's dialogue that he had with James Dobson just before he was executed. And he said, the pornography that I was into and started was such a small thing but he said the real pathology of my own life was this is that nobody else knew what was going on in my life and people let me just let me just uh, challenge you with this that many of us today are not under self-control simply because we are not following our conscience that says you need to be in relationship if I can be as bold as to say this, that one of the reasons why sin remains where it is in a lot of people's life is they've never developed relationships enough to really talk to somebody else to say, this is who I am. And this is what's going on in my life. 
But the nature of sin is to grow under darkness. But the very illustration that the Bible gives us is that when light comes on it, it destroys darkness. Listen to this in James 1.15. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, uh, excuse me, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. The idea is to expose it. To bring it out. And that's what David did. I'm not going to allow this to hide. I'm going to bring it out. I'm going to allow the Spirit of God to deal with me about that. Number three is this. Self-control causes. Self-control causes our words and our actions to align. Self-control causes our words and our actions to align. Verse 7. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack. David's conscience led him to self-control, which stopped him from killing King Saul. The reason David's word had such effect upon his men, now notice this, the reason why it had such effect upon his men is because he was holding a portion of Saul's robe and not his head. That's huge. I mean, what if, what if Saul would have come back with, I mean, David would have come back with Saul's head and said, guys, don't attack. They would have laughed. Because why? Words and actions aligned really do have emphasis upon other people or influence upon other people. I have taken this to note and just to, you can do with this what you want to, but I have always been interested, and I've even talked to people on staff about this, I've always been interested when somebody enters a room and begins to speak. And if it holds other people's attention. And it's just kind of a little theory of mine. Now, there could be anointing. It could be gifting. It, the person may not even be a, a Christian. I don't know. But I know that there is a distinct difference in somebody that has the ability not just to communicate with their mouth, but has the ability to gain people's attention. And I think it's because of this very dynamic. is because their life in private is the same thing as it is in public. David did a very private thing here. Could have been public. But he did a very private thing. And then when he comes back and he speaks to his men, they know that he's really meaning business because he's done what he said. Authority is a really strange thing. And the reason why Jesus had such great authority, as a matter of fact, people would look at Jesus, and when they'd come away from him, they'd say, we have never heard anybody speak like this. Well, why? Well, number one is, is that his actions really backed up his words. When they looked at Jesus, they didn't just see somebody that was talking about it, but that was actually living his life that way. And with that came incredible amounts of authority upon his life. And at one point, they even said, how do you speak in such authority? These, these are in your notes in Mark 1.22. Why do you speak in such authority? And Jesus later not only says, do I speak in such authority? but then went out and cast a demon out of somebody, which basically said, I have not only authority upon my life to say the things, but I also have authority on my life to do the things. And that's what we read in Acts chapter 1, is that Luke records that about this Jesus that just didn't come to teach, but to do. See? When our life's actions, because of self-control, because we do it God's way, we don't do it our way, lines up under what we're saying, then there's incredible amounts of authority that's released. I really believe that that's going to be the, you know, before there's going to be a real revival in America, there's first of all got to be a, a real renewal in the whole idea of what it means to actually be a Christian. It's not by just naming a name. It's by taking on a lifestyle. And the lifestyle basically says this, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. See? And we start living under the realms of what the Bible calls this new kingdom, the kingdom of God, that allows us the privilege under his authority. As a matter of fact, let me say this to you. Christianity is not hard to live. It's impossible. And the only way that we can live it is through dependency upon him that gives us the self-control to exhibit the kind of character that God has for every one of us. Understand. That when self-control causes our words and our actions to align, there's authority that's released. And that's why David had such power. is because his actions and his words aligned. Amen? Number four. 
Self-control produces humility in our lives. Self-control produces humility in our lives. Verse 8. Then David went out to Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down, <clears throat> excuse me, and prostrated himself. David, through self-control, is now exhibiting humility towards King Saul, and it disarms him. One of the attributes, friends, that naturally comes to us is pride and arrogance. Your mother did not send you away to school someday with your sack lunch and say, now, son, I'm really concerned about your humility. I want you to learn about pride. Because we all basically know that it's really easy to develop a life of self-promotion, of exaltation, which is just opposite of what the kingdom of God is all about. And David, now at a point where he really is anointed by God to be king, basically humbles himself. And here's what, here's what David is saying. I don't have to be exalted. I don't have to put myself into some kind of position. God knows how to get me there. See, and I, I, the very thing that goes against our nature is this, is watching somebody else be promoted while you're standing still. And it almost revs up the engine in us to say, well, I want to be noticed too. I want something to happen in my life. And God basically says this, you know, if you will humble yourself, even in certain areas when you have all the right to let yourself be known as to who you are, then I will exalt you. Listen to this in Psalm 75, 6 and 7. No one from the east or from the west or from the desert can exalt a man, but it is God who judges. He brings down one and exalts another. And here's the problem. And I'll just bring up we that are in the ministry more than anything else. You deal with, why do we do this? We deal with motivation. And it's, it's one of those things that I don't know that we'll ever be free from. As a matter of fact, the reason why a lot of guys get out of the ministry anymore is because they don't want to deal with the tension of this particular thing. Why am I doing what I'm doing? I found this article, and I'd like to read it to you, because it really kind of exemplifies the whole idea of what is selfish ambition and what is godly ambition. No minister wants to be perceived as self-centeredly ambitious. Yet what church would want a complacent pastor with no discernible ambition? We wrestle with ambition. How much is necessary? Will we ever quit worrying about having as many in worship as the church across the street? Good, holy ambition drives the mills of excellent ministry, helps us accomplish tasks, the unambition might deem impossible. Transforms churches and maximize gifts. Raw ambition, on the other hand, the desire to claw our way to the top, pours sand in the ministry gears, forces the mach machinery to produce an unholy product, human pride. And here, King David. I mean, I'm just so impressed with this guy. Humbles himself doesn't have to, humbles himself and saying, God, I'm trusting you. Back to a trust issue that we talked about last. You can get me to my destiny, but I can't get me myself there. You can get me to where I need to go. Self-control produces true humility. I don't have to self-promote. God can do that. Amen? Number five. Relationship. Our relationships have potential to be restored through self-control. Relationships have potential to be restored through self-control. Verses 16 and 17. And when David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you poorly. At least for the moment, David, through self-control and humility, won Saul back for a little while. We cannot control others' response to what they might say about us or might do. But that's why Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 15, 5 also says this, overcome evil with good. So David is in a situation where he can potentially destroy a relationship or he can potentially restore one. 
And he's using self-control to try and restore that. Listen to what David says by using words to try and restore a broken relationship. And let me just talk about this for a minute. David says to Saul, my father. I don't know about you, but lots of times in situations when it's, it's heated, and that's why James talks about if you can control your tongue, you're really a mature person. But in heated situations, and you know this is really intense here, between David and Saul. David uses, listen to this now, David uses words to, to try and diffuse a really dangerous situation. Words of endearment. My father. See, and, in, and there are situations where you and I find ourselves in that we're not having a whole lot of self-control for whatever reasons, and we interject words because we want to get back at them. And then wonder why in the world the thing turns to... It's because, again, of a self-control. If we can control. How do we do that? Through intimacy. And so David is using words that is saying, I want to restore relationships. Again, he even takes it to a place of saying, it's not your fault. Why are you listening to these other men? In other words, trying to lay it at somebody else's feet. He's trying to gain relationship back. And self-control does that. And let me just say this as a closing thought. That as we move towards, and I, I, I really challenged you last week towards this whole area about what's coming up in a few weeks and a few months about us moving into our community more. The thing that the thing that people that don't know the Lord really want to hear are words of reconciliation. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. It's the actions that we do towards others that actually leads people to towards repentance. It's the love. I think one of the reasons why the love chapter is between all the works of, and the gifts of the Spirit is because the Apostle Paul knew that love is the most important thing. Love comes from a self-controlled life that basically says, I'm here to serve. I'm not here to be exalted. I'm here to serve. I'm here to draw other people in. All people, let's learn the, let's learn the lesson. Let's be people that are self-controlled, not because we've disciplined ourselves into it, but because we've spent time in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just bow before you tonight. And Lord, we pray that even through our feeble attempts to minister your word, that you would speak about self-control. And that, Lord, we would be people that would recognize that this really is an issue on the table for all of us. And God, I pray tonight that as we worship you, I pray tonight, Lord, as, as you speak to our hearts about areas that we really need to place back under your control. That, Lord, we would be men and women of God to say, it's not my life, it's your life. It's not my way, it's your way. And even though I have urges or even though I see things that I might uh, I want, want to do my way, I want to submit and surrender myself to you afresh and anew. As we worship the Lord, I just want you to do business with God. If the Lord has really kind of impressed you tonight with areas that might be out of control, say, oh Lord, I want to develop intimacy with you again. I don't want to do this thing with the, the urge of trying just to discipline myself, but I want to do it through relationship with you. And so as we worship the Lord, I just want you to make yourself available. Expose your heart. And just say, God, do a work in me tonight. Let's worship the Lord. You be obedient to God.